Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the White House Recovery Month Summit. Now, whether you're here today in person or watching online, thank you all for joining in this conversation today. Now, I also want to have a special welcome to some of the guests who are here and some of the others um, as well who may be coming, including the second gentleman, Doug Amhoff, as well as Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh. Um, and I'm really grateful to have uh, Representative Tron as well as Dean here with us today. Thank you. You know, President Biden has proclaimed September as National Recovery Month in recognition of the tens of millions of Americans in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. And as the President said, everyone who experiences substance use disorder is capable of achieving and sustaining recovery. And this administration will support all Americans on their recovery journey. Now, being in recovery is a remarkable achievement. And we celebrate everyone who has achieved it and everyone who helped them along the way. We're here today to talk about how we can improve recovery support infrastructure to help even more people get there. Now, at a time when our nation is facing 108,000 overdose deaths in just 12 months, this mission has never been more important, more urgent, or more critical. We are really living in historic times. And President Biden and this administration are taking historic actions to meet this challenge. Now, our North Star is to save lives and connect more Americans to treatment and recovery support services. Now, let me say this. We're already seeing our efforts take effect. After more than 35 percent increase in overdose deaths during the first 18 months of the pandemic, the more recent 12-month rolling total overdose death counts have remained largely unchanged. The Biden-Harris administration has delivered more than $5 billion through American Rescue Plan to address mental health and substance use, as well as new funding for harm reduction, community-based prevention and treatment, and law enforcement, and so much more. Today, building on the progress that we have already made, the Biden-Harris administration is announcing several key investments and actions to reduce overdose deaths, to ensure that public health and law enforcement officials on the front lives, lines have the resources that they need to support people in recovery, and finally, to beat this epidemic. Now, let me talk about these actions a little bit. These actions include $1.5 billion from HHS for all 50 states and tribal communities to address addiction and the overdose epidemic. These actions also include an additional $12 million for law enforcement officials on the front lines of this epidemic. This is on top of the $275 million already awarded by the White House to the HIDA program, or High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, for federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement coordination. Now, specifically, this funding will support violence reduction through the Crime Gun Intelligence Initiative, preventing substance use and reducing overdoses, and targeting illicit finance. These announcements also include the launch of a new online recovery ready workplace resource hub with information and resources for businesses, unions, and others who want to learn more about the benefits of becoming recovery ready workplaces. Also, we're really excited to talk about new guidance from the FDA, effective immediately to help reduce barriers in obtaining access to 
FDA approved naloxone products that reverse overdoses. In addition, actions targeting the global fentanyl supply chain are also included, which continues to drive overdose deaths in this country. This includes sanctions against individuals involved with the Sinaloa and CJNG cartels. A key part of beating this epidemic is hitting drug cartels and traffickers where it hurts them the most, their wallets. And with these sanctions, we're working hard to make drug trafficking more costly for them in every way. Because this gives our public health investments time to take root so that people with substance use disorder stay alive, get the help they need, and have a chance to start their journey to recovery and stay on the path. Now, these actions that I mentioned today all support President Biden's unity agenda for the nation, and they're helping advance the President's national drug control strategy. Now, today we're going to talk about recovery from addiction and what that means for people from all across the nation. Now, as a practicing physician, I recognize that medical treatment is critical, critical to achieving recovery for so many people. But there's so much more. It's employment, especially when around half of the country receives health coverage through their employer. It's housing. It's child care. It's food security. It's education. It's economic uh, opportunity and so much more. There are currently tens of millions of Americans in recovery from substance use disorder. And about 60% of them, 60% are gainfully employed. And people in recovery are dedicated, they're motivated, and they're hardworking. And they're part of our backbone of this nation's economy. I know this personally because we have people in recovery on staff in the White House. And they're some of the best employees we have. And they're dedicated to this important work, committed. Now, earlier this week, I was in New York with Secretary Walsh, and we met a man named, named Ivan. And I've got to talk about, a little bit about Ivan. He said he learned everything about addiction the hard way before rec getting to recovery. Today, he's got a job. He has housing far away from temptations of his old neighborhood. He has a compassionate team of caregivers, and he has confidence. He isn't returning to drug use because he has the supports that he needs from his community to be successful. And you know what he said to us, and we were both there? He said he used to take from his mother and grandmother. And now he's in recovery. He's so proud that he's able to give back to his mother and grandmother. Recovery has changed his life. So this administration, starting at the very top with President Biden, recognizes the value of recovery and we're working hard to build a recovery-ready nation. Because beating this epidemic and supporting people in recovery is not a red state or a blue state issue. It's not a rich or poor issue. It's not a rural or urban issue. It is America's issue. And we're going to all come together on common sense solutions. And that's exactly what the President wants us to do on behalf of Ivan and on behalf of tens of millions of Americans in recovery and on behalf of those who need help getting there. So as we begin our conversation today, I want to introduce a very special uh, person here, he's a friend of mine. Joining us today to talk more about creating recovery-ready workplaces is Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, who is in recovery himself. Secretary Walsh, as you, many of you may know, was formerly the mayor of Boston. He has seen up close what this epidemic has done to our nation's premier cities. He has experience in managing and responding to both overdose epidemic and the COVID-19 pandemic at the same time. And now he's working closely with America's workers and employers to create more recovery-ready workplaces. And I can think of no one better to lead this effort. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh. Thank you very much, Doc. And, and uh, you know, the doctor talked about uh, Monday 
actually it was, it was Monday. We we're in no Tuesday. Tuesday we we're in New York City, and um, and to be honest with you, the first stop we made was to uh, a facility that that was all inclusive. Many of you know it. Uh, know and know these facilities. It was a detox. It was a half not a halfway house, but there was permanent housing there. Uh, there was there was daycare centers there. There was everything, and getting people into recovery. And we had an opportunity to have a roundtable, and, and the, the team, the management of the, of the facility, was very excited about talking about um, how they run the facility. It's been, I think, it's 60 years, something in existence. that They started it. Uh, a lot of their first clients were Vietnam vets that came back addicted to heroin, uh, and, and they had a chance to talk about that. But uh, we, had, Dr. Myself and his team, we, we had a chance to sit down and talk, and Ivan was one of the, one of the speakers there. And there's two other speakers there that, that hit me profoundly, and many of you in this room uh, will know what I mean. Two young women, uh, both mothers. Uh, one came out of, uh, it seemed like a working class family that, 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 uh, in, in New York City, uh, and, and she was, uh, you know, just kind of ran the whole gamut from alcohol to weed to, to drugs to heroin to crystal meth and everything else in there. And she talked about being in recovery and about how her life today is just amazing. And, and you just, you could tell that she had a good, strong foundation by, by hearing her talk. And there was another young woman, she was Latina. And uh, she grew up in a family that um, her father left and her mother was there. And they, they viewed uh, uh, substance use addiction as, as a weakness and kind of go out on your own. And she talked, she didn't really get too much into what she experienced, but she experienced a lot in the streets. She was a young, young woman. Uh, and she experienced a lot in the streets. And you could see the pain in her face. Uh, and you could see the hope in her face a little bit of, of the recovery that she was getting at the, at the facility. But you could see that pain. And, and I only say that to you today because I know many, many of you in this room have dedicated your life to working in this field. And it's about that young woman's pain in her face that we have to continue to f push forward. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Gupta and his team who are super dedicated uh, to, 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 to work in this issue. And I was in this very room the day he got sworn in, and I was excited because uh, we have to do more in this, in this country to support people that are struggling right now. Right now in, in the country, uh, there's somebody sitting under a bridge or in a corner or in a bedroom or in a living room or somewhere putting a needle in their arm or struggling, and they think their life is over, and they have no idea that their life might just, you know, if they get into treatment, just beginning. Uh, so I want to thank you, Doc, and your team for the work you do. I want to thank the Congressman as well for his amazing work and, and Congress's work. Uh, I want to thank all the people in this room. Uh, as I was coming over here today, uh, one of the people I work with says, you don't have anything purple on. You have to wear something purple today. And I'm like, I know, I know. And she kept saying, I'm like, it's kind of like St. Patrick's Day. I'm an Irish kid. You don't have to wear anything green. I'm in recovery today, so I don't need to wear anything purple. So, you know, I'm um, going to leave it right there. But. Um, I want to thank I want to thank each and every one of you in this room for the amazing work you've done. Um, as you can, you know, recovery has 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 given me a life second to none. Um, you know, when I went to detox um, and, and I pulled it, when I went to detox that first night, I was in there. I have one minute. Sorry, I've like I'll, I'll be quick. I'll go real fast. Um, I, I thought my life was over, and, and I had no idea that when I was sitting in detox someday I'd be sitting at the White House talking as a secretary. Uh, and that's what recovery does, and, and that's, that, that's what's important for us today. And there are millions and millions of people across the country that we have to give the same opportunity to. Uh, I'm grateful that, that for the opportunity to be here with you today. You know, President Biden uh, has, has, has addressed uh, and identified addiction crisis and mental health crisis as national priorities. He talked about in his State of the Union speech. Uh, in his unity agenda, he talked about substance use disorder. Uh, he talked about all that, which I got very excited about. Uh, but some of, the, some of the sad things is overdose deaths jump this year, uh, last year at over 100,000. Uh, we, we knew part of it was because of the pandemic and part of it was because of the reality of the situation. Uh, it's also clear that, that as I travel the country, everywhere I go, um, I hear people sharing their experiences with me. Uh, and I try to hit different places wherever I go. Uh, they identify addiction as an issue in their community and in the industry or their workplace. And when I go to a neighborhood, when I go to a city, you know, I usually walk around at night and check it out. And, and you know, no city's immune from it, no community's immune from it, no neighborhood's immune from it. Whether it's rural America, urban America, whatever part of America, you know, this 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 disease is ravaging too many families and too many individuals. Uh, we have made recovery and mental health a priority at the Department of Labor. Um, every person has a role to play. Uh, in, in prevention, in treatment, in recovery, uh, and we're supporting the work that they do. I, have, I also have a couple amazing people here, uh, Ali Kawar and, and Mary Beach from, from my office that, that, that are doing some amazing work around this. We, we're working on safety and job training, uh, making sure health and safety, I should say, and job training. Uh, we're working on access to treatment through healthcare. 
Uh, we're stepping up our enforcement on Mental Health and Parity and Addiction Equity Act, uh, something that was passed by Congress that back in 2011, Ali, I think, Mary, right around then. Uh, what, eight? Yeah, even better. 2008, and we still, we're still not there yet, but we're going to get there. Trust me on that one. Uh, we're making sure that health plans understand the importance of that. Under this law, uh, we're making sure they cannot place stricter limits on mental health and substance use coverage, um, and we'll, we want to continue to do that. You know, the bottom line is that mental health uh, is, a, is, a, is, is, a, is a, mental health and substance use disorder, disorder is a condition, and we need to make sure that it's treated. People get treated, period. That's the bottom line. When you think about, you know, Dr. Gupta talked about people in recovery, there's a ton of people in recovery working in the federal government. And, and when you think about it, those are the folks that show up early, those are the folks that work hard, those are the folks that stay later. And at one point in their life, their life wasn't that, that, in that situation. So we need to make sure people can get the coverage when they need the coverage. Because, because if I wasn't able to make a phone call and get the coverage I had because of my health care, my benefits that I had, uh, I might not be standing here today as Secretary of Labor. I might be a statistic. And that we need to continue to make sure we're doing all the work we can. Um, you know, we're also pleased to announce uh, something new today, along with other steps the administration's taken. We created an online recovery ready workplace resource hub. The hub has information on how to create workplaces that promote and support recovery. Employers can learn about the benefits of being uh, recovery ready, and workers and advocates can, can promote culture change inside their organizations. Uh, I just want to want to close by thanking uh, the Biden-Harris administration, President Biden, and Vice President Harris, who have had many private conversations with around addiction and mental health services, and understanding that they get it, uh, and for them making this, the administration, so welcoming and supportive to people in recovery. Across this government, as you've heard from two of us, and you'll hear from more of us, at every level there are people with lived experiences. We are bringing that experience to work every single day. We're breaking down the stigma, and we're making sure that the, ex that, that the experience of all people uh, impacted or affected by addiction is reflected in our policies. And I want to just, again, just thank you for all the work that, that each and every one of you in this room do. It's pretty exciting about being here. Um, but more importantly, the work that you do is, is some of the most, if not the most important work in the United States. So thank you for that. Uh, and now I have the, the great honor of introducing somebody who is a national expert on the issue uh, that, that sh helps shape recovery. She's a key policy leader in the Department of Health and Human Services. I also want to give a shout out to Secretary Becerra, who has been amazing when we had our meeting with the health insurance companies. It was a I don't know if any insurance companies are in here. I'm assuming they're not. But <laughs> it was a really fun meeting because they didn't really know what to expect. And they came in smiling and they left like frowning, which is good. And so I, I, I thought that was a good thing. Uh, but Assistant Secretary of Mental Health and Substance Use, uh, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much, Secretary Walsh, for that uh, introduction and for your leadership, uh, for sharing your story and for your commitment to recovery. Uh, love the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative and something we're really excited about and, and hoping to see that take off all over the country because recovery friendly work workplaces truly make a difference. Uh, and, and so welcome everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're so excited about the conversations we're going to be having today. Um, wonderful to see so many familiar faces uh, and really looking forward to the time that we're going to be spending uh, this afternoon. Uh, happy Recovery Month. I did have to stop to say that. Happy Recovery Month. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is absolutely an honor and privilege to be here at the White House uh, with all of you today to celebrate the strength and resilience uh, of the recovery community. Uh, and to further engage in meaningful conversation. We're really looking for meaningful conversation uh, around ways we can continue to build community and advance recovery. So really looking forward to our discussions. Um, I'd like also to take this opportunity to share some details about how the Biden-Harris administration is investing unprecedented resources, uh, really unprecedented resources to address the nation's uh, overdose crisis. Uh, we're providing resources for people in need, uh, which include a spectrum of prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction services and supports, um, ultimately with the goal of helping to further advance and promote recovery. Um, we're continuing our focus and our efforts to increase access to services at every level, at every level. Uh, and so I want to share a few examples of some of our work uh, in the area around advancing uh, some of our recovery work. Um, we established an Office of Recovery, uh, announced that last year, and we are excited to be continuing to sort of work on that and stand that up. Uh, um, stay tuned. 
the goal of that office is to advance recovery throughout all of our policies and principles and the work we do across recovery. Um, we truly see recovery as one of our cross-cutting principles, uh, and it's been really exciting to, to engage with the recovery community in conversations around how we can make that office a meaningful office within SAMHSA. Um, we also recently included a recovery innovation challenge, uh, and I was on the scoring team and the judging team for that, and my goodness, I can tell you, there is such recovery innovation happening across the country. It was wonderful to be able to sit through, read through, read the applications, but then also hear the presentations uh, from uh, you know, recovery organizations across the country, and just to hear all the meaningful ways uh, they're reaching into communities and, and truly changing people's lives. Uh, so we're excited to, to announce and, and to implement that in innovation. Received over 350 applications, uh, about triple what we were expecting, <laughs> but it was wonderful to see the, the interest. Um, we also hosted a recovery summit. Uh, and that was a wonderful event where we brought people together from the substance abuse community, the, uh, the uh, mental health, the prevention uh, community, as well as the harm reduction, um, to really look at recovery, uh, to look at our definition of recovery. Oh, I have two minutes. <laughs> to look at our definition of recovery uh, and, and to really think about and plan moving forward, uh, you know, how we can, and actually we're working on developing a national recovery agenda. Uh, and so that summit w is geared towards helping to inform uh, what we'll include in our national recovery agenda. Um, today, I'm also happy to announce that you know the Biden-Harris administration uh, is uh, releasing or announcing about 1.6 billion uh, dollars directly to uh, benefit communities across the country. Uh, these are our state and tribal opioid response grants, uh, also known as SOAR and TOR. It's say that a couple times quickly, but SOAR and TOR, so State Opioid Response Grant and Tribal Opioid Response Grant. Uh, but, but these are really valuable grants that help to enable states, territories, tribal communities uh, to increase access to medication-assisted treatment, um, but also to implement a range of uh, community-based recovery services and supports. And so really pleased to be able to uh, announce those grants. Um, the SOAR grant will also award about $1.4 billion uh, to 58 states and territories, uh, and the TOR grant will award $55 million to about 102 tribes, so 102 tribes across the country. Um, we're additionally awarding about $16.6 million related to funding uh, SOAR and TOR technical assistance programs, and so that's important to be able to provide technical assistance uh, to the grantees that are implementing these programs. Um, and so these historic events, investments we know are about saving lives. Uh, and, and ultimately, that is the goal, saving lives and helping people to move into and advance in terms of long-term recovery. Um, so, you know, I've talked a lot about our programs and our systems, uh, but it's critical that we remember, you know, the, the really crucial part about all of this work, um, and that is the need to help the individuals around us that may be struggling, uh, you know, our family members, um, our friends, uh, children that we know, uh, brothers, our sisters. Uh, ultimately, that's where this work is geared. Um, so we, meet, we remain committed to investing in every community, uh, to increasing services and supports for individuals in need, uh, especially in racially diverse uh, and under-resourced communities. Um, and so now I'm so pleased to uh, be able to shift gears a little bit, and I'd like to welcome uh, participants for our first panel, uh, who is here to discuss uh, how the president's strategy to expand access to public health services uh, and others will help individuals in recovery. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Ryan Hampton, uh, the founder of the Voices Project and Mobilize Recovery. Uh, so Ryan, come on up. Everyone's so excited about the, the you know, the Mobilize Recovery work is. Uh, uh, we also have uh, Phil Rutherford joining us, who's the Chief, op Chief Operating Officer from Faces and Voices of Recovery. Uh, Tiffany Scott, who is a peer counselor in the Maryland Peer Advisory Council. Uh, Carol McDade, who is a principal capital uh, decisions, or who is a principal at Capital Decisions Incorporated and a founding member of Faces and Voices of Recovery. And then also Dorothy West, uh, who is the executive director for the recovery and wellness uh, resources, in, uh, uh, resources in Houston. So. So thank you everyone so much for, for joining us. And you know, I just have to say, I, I so appreciate the work that all of you do. Um, so inspirational, so inspirational. And, and you're making meaningful impacts 
uh, in terms of advancing and promoting and, and addressing recovery. So thank you for the work that you do and thank you for being with us today. I'm just going to dive right in. We have about 25 minutes and so really interested in hearing, uh, hearing from you. Um, so for each of our panelists, can, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, about yourself and about your recovery and your recovery journey? And we'll just go right down the line. Uh, it's great to be here, and first and foremost, uh, Ryan Hampton, uh, person in long-term recovery. Uh, I just want to thank SAMHSA, uh, your leadership, uh, Assistant Se Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Coderre, the entire team, this administration for centering the voices of recovery, so thank you for that. Uh, I am a person in recovery, I claim because of luck um, and because of Medicaid. Uh, recovery uh, support saved my life, housing saved my life. Um, access to a peer recovery support community uh, saved my life. Treatment was great, but it was those long-term services uh, that led me onto my journey uh, in recovery. And I think we need to be focusing uh, more on those services, which is why we're so grateful to be here to support the administration's priorities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Carol McDade, and I'm a woman in long-term recovery. And for me, that means I've been alcohol and drug free. It'll be 25 years in November. <laughs> and like Ryan, I got there through kind of coupling a number of different pathways and supports. I started off with access to both inpatient and outpatient treatment, professional treatment mm -hmm. in the private sector, which unfortunately I had to, and my family had to pay for out of pocket because despite the fact that I had a good commercial insurance plan, it didn't cover it. Mm -hmm. um, I also got help by having, living in recovery housing, mm -hmm. and I got peer supports in the community in which I lived. And I have also um, benefited from uh, medication for my me co-occurring mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. And one thing I was struck by, you each mentioned a range of uh, community supports, community recovery supports, and we often hear that, that you know, recovery happens in community, uh, both figuratively and, and literally, so thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks. I'm Phil Rutherford, and I'm a black man in long-term recovery, and I know that you guys may have already figured that out, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I want to say that because far too often images of people like me are not associated with recovery, and it's really important for me to, to, to mention that. Um, and uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman, I appreciate you mentioning community services and community supports, because for me, what, what really made the difference, I had access to treatment and other things early on, but finding culturally specific programming and, and targeted things that worked for my, commu my community and my life experience are really what made the difference for me, so. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Phil, and thank you for sharing your story and, and, and for, for noting the piece around recovery and, and the importance of culturally congruent and culturally responsive recovery services. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Tiffany Scott and I'm a person in long-term recovery from a family perspective. And what that means for me is my mom is championing recovery as we speak right now, today. My recovery process came from specifically to community. My family wanted recovery for my mom, essentially, but she needed support. And I learned about recovery by visiting a local recovery center and a recovery residence which she entered through incarceration. I just kept showing up. I wanted to know how can you recover in a residence and you couldn't recover at home. And what I understood was there was love, care, and compassion happening inside of that recovery residence. And so I use my voice today to lift others and tell them that recovery is possible, family supports are needed, and we are in this together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Dorothy? Hello, everyone. My name is Dorothy West. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is in October, I'll have 19 years. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. Um, my girlfriend, you know, she was happy for me. She says, Dorothy, you went from the trap house to the White House. Look at you. <laughs> 
So with that being said, I had used several supports through uh, the pathway of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, from there, um, you know, in and out, I experienced a lot of barriers to recovery. Um, I got locked up, went to the penitentiary for um, crack pipe that was rinsed and they charged me with uh, uh, less than a gram and uh, with the intent to distribute. And I did two years of, of, in the penitentiary, four years on parole. And so when I got out, I went back to school because I couldn't find any employment. I couldn't uh, find housing. So I went to school to become a licensed chemical dependency counselor and I started working on these issues. So today I'm the executive director for the Center for Recovery and Wellness Resources, mm -hmm. an RCO in Houston, Texas. And we work with this population to help them as they reintegrate back into the into society. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that you mentioned. You know, you know. Unfortunately, sometimes there are barriers, and and I think from a policy and a system perspective, it's so important um, for me and for us to hear about what are some of those barriers, because then it gives us places of possible intervention and places to try to um, intervene to help to increase and ensure access. Uh, you know, Tiffany, you mentioned families, that you know, resources for families are really important. Um, and sometimes we hear that you know, when there's a lack of those resources, that can feel like a barrier. Um, so what about other barriers that you all may have experienced and, and thoughts or recommendations that you may have there around how to address those? I'll just start by saying, you know, I'm in recovery from opioid use disorder. Um, the, the biggest barrier for me getting into recovery, so my first attempt at treatment uh, was in 2006. Um, I, my last uh, treatment episode ended in 2015. Mm -hmm. I went to almost a dozen treatment facilities in that time frame. It wasn't until the very last treatment facility that I was offered access mm -hmm. to medication-assisted treatment, to buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. um, my family fought tooth and nail to try to get me on buprenorphine many mm -hmm. times, and we were told by treatment providers mm -hmm. that it wasn't a good option, mm -hmm. uh, and that it was a crutch. And I believe that, and, and my insurance company wouldn't pay for it also. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge uh, barrier. And we, I finally got on MAT, it saved my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on it for the first part of my recovery. Um, and it was a game changer for me. I believe that one of the barriers within the recovery community is we still have a lot of work to do to break down the judgment uh, and the shame that exists for people who are on OUD medications and the housing discrimination that exists and the employment discrimination that exists and even, you know, kind of the frowning upon it within qualified treatment facilities. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's such an important point. We know that there's a lot of work to do there in terms of addressing the stigma. Uh, and to, to help to develop more appropriate understanding of, of the value of medication-assisted treatment. So thank you for sharing your experiences there. Yeah, yeah I think that um, one thing is we talk a lot about all pathways to, be, to recovery being encouraged, but sometimes it feels like um, within the field uh, there'll be certain pathways that are looked upon as better or more important or whatever. And I think if we're going to talk about all pathways to recovery, Everything from abstinence based to medication to harm reduction, all of those have to be used. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to lose the patient voice. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if medication is the gold standard, which it is, if a person has failed at it five times, then that patient voice needs to come through, that yeah. they have some choice in the pathway rather mm -hmm. than sort of, you know, telling them you'll be dead in a year if you don't go the pathway that mm -hmm. we're choosing for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such an important, thank you. Thank you for that. And it's such an important point around, you know, patient, uh, individuals' voices around their experiences is so, it's so valuable. Um, we often hear that, you know, nothing about us without us to include uh, individual treatment journeys. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I just want to support that. I, the, even the concept of a failed attempt. Um, I suppose you could look at my life story and say I had a number of failed attempts, but I don't think so because I'm here. I'm alive. Yes. I, I survived. So those, and, and on the subject of medication, um, because specifically um, I have stimulant use disorder, specifically around that, there is a lot of work that needs to be done around medication for stimulant use and other, other substances. Um, and I know that I'm participate with the FDA on some things. I know there's work being done there, but we need more work and more, a more aggressive posture on stimulant use disorder and, and other substances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Thank you. Including contingency management. Contingency management. Regulations on contingency management are needed. They've been needed. Mm -hmm. There's no medication for stimulant use disorder. Mm -hmm. And the administration needs to act on lifting that cap. That yeah. makes that difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. Know that we're taking all of this in. Uh, it's so valuable to get this type of direct input and feedback. And, and uh, you know, uh, contingency management, that is definitely one of the areas that we're looking at. So appreciate your, your raising that. When you asked about barriers, I was aligning my PowerPoint bullets in my mind. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> one of the greatest barriers to treatment is time. Mm. Recovery is every second a day, as I mentioned, and if organizations are closed, mm -hmm. no one can access it. Mm -hmm. We need expansion and treatment options for individuals in and seeking recovery 24 hours a day mm -hmm. in every jurisdiction, in every state, and across the country. No one should be denied access. Last week I mentioned if a person had cancer and they wanted to go to the hospital, there was no close off they could get there. Mm -hmm. That should be the same for a person seeking services, mm -hmm. especially treatment and access to recovery. Mm -hmm. My other mention is around funding. We have individuals with lived experience who are able to access and serve people in recovery. However, there's lots of barriers around how they are supported financially. So access to dollars to support those individuals in lived experience is valuable. And our young people, there's limited opportunities for housing. There's limited opportunities for treatment for anyone in and seeking recovery. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate that feedback. I mean, know that, that this is something that we are committed to within the, the SAMHSA Office of Recovery uh, that is involving young people throughout the work that we do to, and, and also the voices of individuals with lived experience throughout our work. Um, but I also appreciate your point around time. Uh, that uh, individuals being able to access and needing to access services, uh, you know, around the clock, that, that that is important. We certainly have heard that before, so thank you. Okay, any other? So I can agree with everything everyone said. I also want to add to that is detox. We need more detox beds. We need more. The wait from someone walking in your door wanting help to the time they actually get that help is critical and a crucial time. So, you know, we would love to have more funds put towards detox um, beds, um, available uh, services to help individuals get right into treatment when they need it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And it's something that we hear a lot also, and, and so certainly looking at that as well. So thank you for that. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, workplaces. You know, Secretary Walsh talked a lot about the work related to, uh, you know, developing recovery-friendly and recovery-supporting workplaces. Um, what thoughts or recommendations do you have there in terms of workplaces supporting um, individuals in recovery? I, I would say two things, and I'll keep it brief. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard as we've been traveling around the country on this bus mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks uh, are health plans, right? Mm -hmm. Employers, you know, need to be offering good health plans to their employees. If an employer's health plan does not have robust addiction, long-term addiction and mental health care, it's a bad health plan, right? And that mm -hmm. should be first. Second, and we heard it last week at Health and Human Services mm -hmm. uh, from one of our advocates, is as a consumer, of many services um, that corporations provide around this country, I and knowing that there are many consumers like me, right? Over 23 million of us is the last uh, count that I I know of. Um, I'd like to see some sort of corporate recovery index, mm -hmm. right? Where I'm able to actually look at where a company stands in implementing recovery-friendly workplaces, because those are the places that I'd like to put my dollars into. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think one thing that might help with additional jobs um, at various employers is right now in the tax code, we have a credit for people who employ people who are justice involved. We have um, tax credits for people, a whole variety of subpopulations of people. Mm -hmm. Individuals with substance use disorders is not on that list. And I think if it was, I think you'd see more employers taking advantage of that tax credit and hiring our people. I think the same is true about for housing. I think we need to incentivize, instead of us always facing when we 
start a new recovery house at McShen, that it's not in my backyard, don't put it here. Mm -hmm. I think if we gave uh, you know, people who buy houses, gave them tax credits mm -hmm. for allowing their house to be served as a recovery house, it would go a long way on both of those things. Mm -hmm. Very creative ideas, thank you. I was told to keep this brief because I have a whole bulleted list. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the Watsi thing, for, sh for sure, the work opportunity tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, conceptually, some sort of pipeline between, there, so there are a lot of community-based recovery organizations that are dealing with people that are actively working through recovery. Um, perhaps some sort of pipeline between them and employers, something that, mm -hmm. that prioritizes those employees or perhaps moves funding that way. Um, also, this, the, the business of, and I'm thinking of an organization specifically that I worked with that did uh, CNC machining, and we did some research on them and discovered that more than half of the people they were losing in their, in their employment, they were losing to substance use disorder. They figured out that, and this is SHRM data, that it was costing them about 30000 a person mm -hmm. to replace a skilled machinist. Um, and what we were doing, we were trying to keep our business afloat, so we sold them recovery support services for a fraction of that cost. So there's, there's something to be done in a public-private partnership around recovery support services in businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I would land on, I love the tax credit opportunity, but also education mm -hmm. for any organization who has an interest for hire or actively have employees there who are hiding behind the fact that they are re in recovery. We know that people are in recovery um, and the employers want to support. I, I connect with many people and they want to support their employees but they simply do not know how and what services to access other than stigma and a suspension. So if there's some ways that you can implement some say practices, some good policies around supporting individuals in their recovery and also community education beyond mm -hmm. um, just entering in an entry level position of recovery through workforce development, individuals in recovery would like to go back to school. They want to thrive. They want to mm -hmm. become doctors. They want to become lawyers, you know, and still utilize their skills of recovery. So if there was ways to support any employer, I simply would say education. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. And I love the idea about resources, you know, resources and ideas around how to support uh, individuals in recovery in a workplace. So thank you. Yeah. Well, she stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's great minds think alike, right? So. <laughs> well, that's some good stuff. I always was thinking about um, training, making sure the employer knows how to work with individuals in recovery. Um, it's, it's imperative that recovery language is used in order to sustain that employee. That employee needs to feel safe and heard. And also for the employer to know what it is like to motivate and encourage and uplift a person on staff that has a substance use disorder or mental health disorder. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Can, uh, just, yeah, go ahead. Just, yep. one, just one last thing. Yes. I, I know they, they told me to keep it short. I'm going to. Um, all, all of these things fit into a basket. The, in, in the workplace, when someone uh, is determined to have, someone has cancer or someone has other, another illness, everyone in the workplace is like, oh, that's, that person's out because they have this illness. Mm -hmm we need to normalize recovery. Mm -hmm. We need to do something to make it so that in the workplace, when, when, when someone is determined to have SUD, that it's not, it's not a scarlet letter, that it's, that, it's, that it's okay, that they have a treatable illness and, and, and hopefully they'll get better. That's all, yeah. I'll get off the soapbox. No, thank you, thank you all so much. I know we're, we're right at time, but I just want to thank you for being here um, and for the work that you each do every day to promote and advance recovery, and so thank you. there because I'm so excited about what I get to do next. <laughs> so it, it is with great pleasure that, that I get to announce and, and introduce uh, the second gentleman who is here with us uh, this afternoon. And I just want to thank you for your leadership uh, and for your support of recovery. 
Um, we've been on several panels, uh, uh, a couple panels this week, and just really appreciate your presence and support of uh, mental health and recovery. And so I want to invite you to say a few words, thank thank you, gentlemen. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, and thanks so much for all you do. Uh, you, you do so much for all of us, um, and not always in front of all these cameras and all these people, and um, you're just what public service is all about. I see my uh, very good friend and colleague, uh, Secretary Marty Walsh here. Uh, Secretary, thank you for all you do as well, uh, not only uh, being such a public and, and open advocate of sharing your own lived experience, uh, being in recovery all these years, but for all you do for our country and this administration, and I'm really uh, happy to call you a good friend, as is, does the Vice President. Dr. Gupta, uh, we, we are doing a lot of work together, and um, as I told you, uh, in front of cameras and behind the scenes, and to your team, who are so amazing, uh, whatever you need, I'm going to be there because this issue is just so, so, so important. So thank you for all the work you do and all the other, thank you. And all the other, the leaders uh, from the administration, uh, the families, some of whom I've, I've had the honor of meeting already uh, in the White House a couple of weeks ago. They came in and shared their stories. Uh, these, these very painful stories as the, the family members who have been left behind. And, um, you know, I told you when you came in I was going to go talk to the Vice President about it. I even talked to the, the Secretary as well and Dr. Gupta and the team. So it's worth coming here and I know it's hard and I know it's, it can be tough to share, but thank you for doing that. And uh, I see some of the folks this morning from the, from the bus. Uh, all dressed up now, but uh, uh, that doing that's important. Getting the word out sometimes by showing it, and, and instead of saying it, but by showing it, that really matters. And to, to be able to sign that bus and just to tell the world that this administration has your back, period, uh, was, was thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I know this room knows that this issue a lot of people don't like to talk about it. There's a stigma to it, and it's uncomfortable, and it's hard, but that's not an excuse. We need to all do what you're all doing, is to be out publicly and openly talking about this issue so we can continue to do something about it. So thank you for doing that. And this is National Recovery Month, and as part of that, we are, we're really celebrating uh, the recovery of tens of millions of people uh, who, who are doing the hard work to go through recovery and stay in recovery, and then many of you who then make it your life's work to, uh, to spread that word. So thank you for that. Uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Gupta and I convened uh, a group of families, many whom I see again here today. Uh, they lost a loved one due to fentanyl poisoning. and. Um, these brave family members talked about the pain of that loss, but uh, they also talked about the stigma associated with just even talking about it. And they urged me and they urged us and they're continuing to urge all of us to, to be compassionate about it when you speak about it, but to actually speak about it because we have to talk about it. We, we also talked about what tools do we have and what tools do we need to, to fight back? And we just got to be open about that too. We need the tools and resources uh, to fight addiction because if we can fight addiction, we can hopefully not lose the, the, the next family member. And so today, uh, we proudly announced new actions by the Biden-Harris administration to support individuals and communities on their recovery journey. Uh, President Biden, you know, has made this a priority. He mentioned that in the uh, State of the Union address, uh, that one of the pillars of the unity agenda is to beat the opioid scourge and uh, epidemic. The Vice President as well, along with the President, they are standing firm on their commitment, not, <laughs> not just with words, because again, talk is cheap but what are you actually doing? What actions are you actually taking? 
and the Biden-Harris administration is taking action. Uh, as I hope you've heard, or maybe I'm the one announcing it, I don't know, but um, <laughs> $1.5 billion, which is a lot of money, to all states and territories to go towards beating the opioid crisis and to support people in recovery. So that is tangible action, and that money is going to be well served out in the, all these communities. Uh, $104 million to expand substance use uh, treatment and prevention in rural communities, which, as we know, don't get enough attention uh, to beat this, uh, this epidemic, which, again, as I traveled around the country, it's something that you certainly see. Uh, $20.5 million in grant funding to help foster recovery in communities throughout the United States, which is important, and a lot of other resources, which you have heard about or will hear about. Um, it's, you know, I'm a dad, I'm a lot of parents out there, so we, of course, we always think about everything we do in this administration through that lens as, as parents and, and what effect it has on our youth. Uh, so right now, we know more than ever, yeah, youth substance abuse is something that uh, we must do something about, and we saw the bus today, and one of the things that really impacted me were the, the birth dates and the, the, the death dates. Far too many of those dates were too short, were too short. They were children, frankly, and that's not okay. So um, this is just, uh, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. This isn't just uh, a one-day thing where this administration focuses on this issue. This is, a, this is an issue that this administration will continue to focus on each and every day. Um, I know we have a, a great panel coming up, so I, I know you're here to hear that uh, from this amazing uh, show called Dope Sick, which uh, uh, had a lot of acclaim, uh, as it should. And Dope Sick tells the story of how prescription opioids fuel the overdose crisis uh, that we are still working to end as an administration. And it's not just our administration, because as we all know, we need community leaders, we need families, we need partnerships with media, we need partnerships with the private sector. We all need to come around, because it's all of our responsibility to, to end this crisis. Because, and this one is, this is not political. This, as we all know, this affects red states, blue states, Democrats, Republicans, independents. This doesn't care. It doesn't care. That's why we need to all come together and focus on this. So Dope Sick, two Emmys, uh, it's an awesome show. I'm going to turn it over to Joseph Green, who I had the pleasure of meeting this morning. Where are you, Joseph? Hey, man. Uh, it was good to meet you this morning. And he's a father. He's an artist. He's a, a, great, a great advocate. You can just tell. I met him this morning. Uh, he's a fighter, too, and he's doing it for all of us. He's going to moderate this panel and um, enjoy it. Uh, it's an honor to be in this administration. It's an honor uh, to, to focus on issues this important. It's an honor to have met many of you, to meet the rest of you today, and to work with uh, people like Secretary Walsh and Dr. Gupta and everyone else in our administration. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'd like to invite up um, our panelists. Be clever here as they come up. We have the author of Dope Sick, uh, Beth Macy. We have Danny Strong, series co-creator and executive producer, and Dr. Stephen Lloyd. A uh, round of applause. <laughs> oh. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'll say hi to you all because we're in this together. I'll say hi to you all because you have to listen to us be clever, or try to be for the next 25 <laughs> minutes. Um, my name is Joseph Green, and I am uh, the son of Henry and Helen Green. I am the father of August and Henry Green. I am the partner to Angelique Green, and I am able to be all of those things at the level that I do because I am also a person in long-term recovery. And I am extraordinarily excited to be here because of the intersections of my personal life um, both being uh, captured in a film and the fact that I started with theater. And seeing uh, a show like this um, come, come along at a time where it's so vitally important 
for people to see what's happening in our communities um, and to be nervous, honestly, when you see a show coming out and saying, is it going to betray us? Um, and by us, I mean people in recovery, people who are in active use um, and the families thereof uh, in a way that uh, inspires, in a way that makes people want to advocate, in a way that um, brings hope and light to the issue. And I definitely had some conversations with friends of mine who, who work in this in this space and, and you know I wanted to make sure that how I felt about it was like, you know, generally how people were feeling about it. And you all did a wonderful job. You did a wonderful job. Everyone that I've spoken to about this show says that you all did a wonderful job bringing humanity to the screen. And so um, on behalf of some of us, I would like to say thank you for that. Um, and then really get into this because we have about three and a half minutes. Um, <laughs> no, we have about 25 minutes. And um, so I wanted to start with you, Beth. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, no problem. Uh, the question I wanted to start with you was, so you have a new book that just came out, um, Raising Lazarus. And we talked briefly last night. I haven't had a chance to read the book, but I've talked to you about it. And it has a lot of solutions in it, what people are out in the world doing and getting done. Um, I want to take you back all the way to when you turned in the book Dope Sick. What did you hope would happen with this book out in the world? And how has it led to where you are now and what you're doing with your writing and your work? Great question. Um, so when I started working on it, my editor, Vanessa Mobley, said, your job is to impose hope in order on a sad and chaotic story. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> um, and when I finished the book, I really thought I never wanted to write about the opioid crisis again. My husband said, why don't you do a cookbook? Because it was really dark. And, um, and as I was traveling around talking about it, I started to see really innovative things that were happening, where law enforcement and harm reduction and treatment were starting, and healthcare were starting to come together. And with this opioid litigation money uh, about to come down the pike, or already starting to come down the pike, I really saw this as a kind of a template that communities could use. But in the meantime, I got to work with these amazing people. Uh, when I got paired up with Danny, or I was lucky to get paired up with Danny. He had his own opioid project going. They had us meet in the middle between LA and Virginia to see if we would get along in Chicago, <laughs> and we did. And uh, he was just game on. Um, my goals for the show going in were A, that we not stereotype Appalachia, because that's where I live. I still need to go to Kroger every day. <laughs> um, and for us to have a really strong storyline about medication-assisted treatment. So when you see an A-list actor like Michael Keaton having trouble getting on methadone and then having trouble getting on Suboxone, and you can watch, I mean, Danny has brilliantly uh, written this show that it's a, it's a crime thriller, but it's also this, this great story of these heroes that are trying to bring justice for a nation as well as the stories of, you'll hear from Dr. Steve in a minute, but Dr. Steve was, uh, his story we pulled directly from for the Michael Keaton character. And so that's really powerful that a person could come away, eight hours of television, be entertained, but also more importantly, understand how we got here and what we need to do to get out of it. Thank you for that. Um, next question, Danny. Um, so I went directly to your IMDb. Um, I was like, I want to learn more about you aside from what you're doing here. And one thing I couldn't find was like a thematic through line of projects that you're a part of. You act, you direct, you write. Um, and my question to you is, what about this project got you excited about it and wanting to do it? And how has that turned into some of the advocacy and the work that you now do now that the project is wrapped? You know, so I've done a few. Uh, well, first off, thank you so much for having me here. I was so honored to be here. And I found that last panel so moving, um, really wonderful solutions. Um, I've done a few uh, modern day sort of hot button projects. I wrote the movie Recount about the Florida Recount. I wrote the movie Game Change about John McCain picking Sarah Palin. And I was looking for another type project like that to do. 
And a producer, this great producer, John Goldwyn, came to me and he said, um, why don't you do the story of the opioid crisis in the Sackler family and their creation of this crisis? And I didn't, to be honest with you, know a lot about it. And I started researching it and I was shocked, horrified, stunned. This was 2018. It had seemed as if they had gotten away with this at that point. There's been somewhat of a social reckoning at this point, um, not a legal reckoning, although I believe there should be. Um, but so I just was uh, blown away by this story. And once I realized, oh, I could take this subject matter, which is very dark, depressing, sad, simultaneously infuse it as a crime thriller to find an entertaining hook for an audience to take them through the story, I thought, okay, I have to do this. I have to, I have to shine a light on, A, the crimes of the Sackler family, uh, and that's the show's very much an indictment of those crimes, but B, I had come to realize in the research how uh, this, uh, that my perception of addiction was completely wrong that I had the perception of addiction that I think a lot of the country has, which is to blame the addicted, which, by the way, was the playbook of Richard Sackler and the Sackler family, and that's how they were able to keep this going for so many years, right? But I thought, wow, I've been, I I'm so wrong about this that, in fact, uh, addiction is a disease, that, and there are solutions to this. And I thought, oh, I've got to tell the story. I've got to get this information out to as broad an audience as possible. Uh, and am deeply, deeply grateful to Hulu for giving us the money to make this story. This is not a common thing where Hollywood's like, here's $80 million to make a limited series. No about. one else wanted to make no it. No one else wanted to make it. Um, so the fact that, that we got to make it, that it had impact, uh, that we were able to shine a light on, on these addiction issues, but also on MAT, uh, which is still highly stigmatized. I had read uh, at the time, you know, 14% of people that need Suboxone actually get it. It's like saying 14% 14 of people that have cancer get chemotherapy or have <laughs> surgery for it. I mean, I just was horrified by that statistic, and I thought... It's actually worse than that. Yeah. Dr. Gupta told me today, latest research shows just 5%. I mean, that's it's staggering, right? If you could double that, triple that, quadruple it, um, the amount of lives you could change. And so th those were all the goals of the show, were, were basically those three main goals. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Steven, uh, who uh, asked me to call him Steve, so I'm not doing that, I'm, uh, with his permission. It's good. <laughs> I was like, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so we're both in recovery, and there is something, I think, special about folks who go through recovery and then uh, want to dedicate their lives um, to making the lives of people who need to be in recovery um, better and creating systems and things of that sort. Um, I'm, a, I'm a poet and a writer, and I told you this beforehand. There's a line that I have in a poem, um, and it's, um, if the universe is to ever extract the remaining usefulness from us, forgiveness has to be an olive branch we eventually extend ourselves. And so I wanted to ask you, what was that process like for you going from um, the space where you were, getting into recovery, and then turning around and saying, I'm not just going to be in recovery, I'm going to become an advocate for people who are in need? What was that? Thanks, Joseph. Uh, and that's a you know, very shallow question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not at all, because as I told you, it, it's an ongoing process. And you know we talk about this, and Ryan Hampton mentioned it earlier in the, in the treatment world. The treatment uh, industry, a lot of times, when somebody is struggling and they relapse, they kick them out. Where are they going to go? We don't talk about the things that we want to talk about, which is forgive people, uh, you know, habitually, uh, you know, love people unconditionally, and demonstrate mercy. The three things that I want to do every day of my life. So recovery, not only changed my life in the obvious ways, it allowed me to be a dad and a and a and a, and a husband and you know an educator. I'm an internal medicine uh, physician by training and a hospitalist, but it changed everything about my career. And so uh, when I got into recovery and I started learning about addictions, because believe it or not, medical schools and residencies don't teach our young doctors about addictions. So just so you know that. 
And as I started to learn about addiction and I started to learn about myself and how my history of genetics and childhood trauma with physical and sexual abuse, you know, put me where I am. It's not an excuse. It's how I got where I am. It changed everything for me, Joseph. And, and then, uh, you know, then my life goes on. And some people in this room that I've known for, for a little while, and you think, you know, there's these secrets that you have inside that you're going to keep with you forever. And then I met Beth Macy, who I love. Uh, in so many different ways, and, and she, uh, you know, she's talking to me about the project her and Danny are working on, and, and uh, you know, we're looking at different scenarios, and so well, why don't we just use yours, I think pretty much was the line, and, and so, uh, you know, those were things on, on the screen that Danny's just brilliant, I mean, he's an ungodly s storyteller, and, and Beth is as well, and, and so the things I was going to keep inside of me are now on the screen for more than 15 million people to see. And, uh, and, and it's good for me. But one of the things I didn't take into consideration was my wife watching that. <laughs> right? And, and oh, and, and so I lived through it and I walked through it. And Joseph's question is a good one because forgiving myself is tough because I bought into this fact that it's a moral failure and that I'm somehow defective. And I did pretty good for somebody who was defective. I got through med school. Mm -hmm. But... But I had this thing I was carrying around with me that I was ashamed of. And, and so, Joseph, it's an ongoing process. I still do it. I love the stories, though, and how they portrayed them. The, the, you know, the opening of the drawer and the pill bottles. I remember that day in my office very specifically. Um, you know, the, the fist through the, through the plate glass to, to get the drugs. Um, you know, just all of those things that happened in my life. I'm so grateful for them because now they allow me to connect with my patients. When I see my patients hanging their head, I know. And I don't have to point out anything they've done. I just share with them what I did, right? And now I've got a connection. So it changed my life on every front. And I want to tell you one huge area it changed because the previous panelist up here, Dorothy, I fell in love with her in about 15 seconds. She said she went from the trap house to the White House, <laughs> which is one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. <laughs> and, and so the criminal justice system. I had no idea about it. I didn't grow up that way, was never involved in it, but the number of people we have incarcerated in the United States, uh, secondary to substance use disorder is appalling, and I want to offer them treatment rather than incarceration, and so I didn't have any idea about that system, and, and my recovery process helped me, and then Danny and Beth comes along in my life and puts this platform out there now that we reach millions of people. I'll tell you this, you two don't know this. I have patients on MAT whose families say that you're, you're trading one drug for another. Hear it all the time. And they did an article in the Tennessee and where I live. I'm, I live in Nashville now. And, and the parents of these kids who these kids were being chastised by their families. And they saw that I was the dope sick doctor. And they decided it was all right that they came to see me. That stuff, you all don't even know happens. Yeah. So I want to make sure and point that out. But Joseph, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you, you so much. And thank you for the work that you do. You. All right. We're just going to go down one more time. All right. Beth. Um, it is, as somebody in um, recovery and as someone who has lent their life to storytelling through a documentary, um, I was very nervous when uh, Greg and Jeff came to me and said, hey, uh, we want to follow you around and, and, and tell your story. How do you, um, one, hold the, the trust of the of the of the people who you, the subjects of your stories, and how do you um, not convince people, but, but try to let them know that their story is going to be used for good ultimately? Yeah, when I followed a young woman named Tess Henry who was in her mid twenties for for the second half of Dope Sick, the book is about her journey, and she was about five years into heroin addiction and a young mother when I first met her, and a friend of mine introduced me to her and said, uh, knew I was working on a book about opioids. And so the first time I met her, she described how she had been overprescribed in an urgent care center, um, two 30-day opioids for a case of bronchitis, and then the usual pathway. And, um, and what she said to me in 2015, the first time I talked to her, was we need urgent care for the addicted. And she didn't know what that meant. And I didn't know what it meant because neither one of us had really ever seen it out in the world. And so what I said to her was, I just want to spend time with you. I want to check in with you once a week. I, I can't promise you you'll be in the book, but I promise you I'll, I'll always be transparent. I'll never lie to you. I hope you'll never lie to me. And you know, we were honestly in touch until just a few weeks before her tragic uh, death on Christmas Eve of 2017. Um, transparency, 
kindness. I know a lot of, I go right to the line, that ethical line. I, 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 I get involved with some of my folks. I, if, if they ask me for help, that's a conversation we're gonna have. I don't just say, no, sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, and I always tell them I'm going to fact check at the end. I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Some of my harm reductionists in the new book are literally breaking laws to delivery, to delivering life-saving care to folks. And, um, so I'm going to go back to them and I'm going to say, hey, can I use your name? No, no, that's fine. What name are we going to use instead? And this group of folks has been so marginalized. Uh, I think we need to, uh, you know, bend some journalistic rules in order to get to the truth of the story. I had an editor early on in my book writing career who said, I've never worked with an author that gets so close to the people they write about. And I'm like, dude, how do you think I get these stories? Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't come to you. You got to go both ways. And yeah. I think that's so important when you're working with marginalized communities. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, Danny? Uh, I was teeing you up for it last time, but I'm going to be very specific this time. All right. Um, I, I'm here today with, with uh, Mobilize Recovery, and I'm an advocate for them. And I have heard that you have become an advocate for um, people in this space and for the resources that are needed to save lives. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about how this project has, I guess, evangelized you into advocacy and what that looks like today. Yeah, I mean, I'm so moved by everything that I read. So moved by Dr. Steve. Literally, he was just talking about it. I was just like getting teary-eyed, you know? And, and by the way, Beth's new book, Raising Lazarus, is incredible. Uh, hopeful solutions, and I think, I think you can have a greater advocacy than, than Beth and her new book, yeah. right? With all these, uh, and, uh, just the story of the harm reductionist, which was another area that I had biased stereotypes against uh, that I didn't understand. And reading her book, I'm like, wow, these people are incredible and what they do is incredible. Typical Hollywood though, he calls me up after he finishes and in one sentence he puts my book, it took me 400 pages to tell. He said, <laughs> harm reduction is a gateway to MAT and MAT is a gateway to recovery. And that's what America doesn't understand. But anyways, I love I love you, and I love the way <laughs> you put like things. T-shirt. I know. Let's get on that, Ryan. Yeah, we got to get away. I, I don't know how many T-shirts we'll sell, but we can, yeah. we can try. We can try. Um, I know, so, right? <laughs> so you know, the, the the show itself was an act of advocacy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of unabashed, heart on its sleeve. Um, I didn't care that, that it was that it was so obvious. That's what it was. I think this was a story, and this story and this issue needs to be treated in that way. There's no subtlety here. Um, it needs to be treated with a bazooka, um, and the idea of of shining a light on MAT, which is which is such a clear solution, right? There's a sickness. There's medicine for it. And th that that solution is so stigmatized for many different reasons that are complicated, not so complicated. You know, your your phrase of it's just trading one drug for another, but it's not. It's medicine, right? So anything, I just thought anything we could do, and if you've seen the show, the final episode, it, it's like it might as well be called the love letter to MAT. I mean, that's literally what the final episode of, of the show's about. So, so from there, I've just become, anything I can do with the issue, I'll do, like being here today. It's anyone who calls me and says, hey, will you, well, not anyone, so don't get, you know, don't get crazy. <laughs> don't give out uh, yeah, yeah. But, but a DOJ rally. Yeah, there was a DOJ rally. Uh, Ed Bish, one of the great activists, lost his son uh, to OxyContin, had this rally outside the Justice Department um, to, to plead with the Justice Department to indict members of the Sackler family asked me to speak at that. I was honored to speak at it. I was thrilled to speak at yeah. it, right? So it, it's one of those, I, I haven't worked on a project like this for me where it's continued post the project to yeah. this extent. It's been out for a year now and, and, and we're still, you know, we, there's still lots of discussions. Yeah. Obviously why this panel is here today, why you're all here today, is because there is so much work that needs to be done. But I think what is hopeful and inspiring is it seems like we've turned a corner on the narrative at least. And I think people are open um, to these solutions. They're open to talking about this in such a, a, a way, and, and thank you, Dr. Gupta, for everything you've done. Um, I just think that, that we're at a tipping point 
we're at a bad tipping point, but we're at a good tipping point as far as information goes. Yeah. And anything that we can do to keep blasting with a bazooka the solutions, and, and I don't want to say they're simple, but in some cases, they are. Yeah. Buprenorphine, right? Yeah. Medicine. Uh, anything we can do to, to just create access to that for as many people as possible is will be a massive step forward and change many lives. Yeah, the, uh, the, the solutions are out there convincing people that we should be doing them is part of the work that I think storytelling does. Um, so this is the last question. We got one minute left, uh, st uh, Steve. Um, my, my buddy Steve. Um, part of re the reason we're here is because you were willing to tell your story. Um, and I believe in the power of story to transform spaces. It's the work that I do now as a, as a professional and as a storyteller. What would you say to somebody who was nervous about sharing their story? Not necessarily on a platform as big as this one, but I mean, you know, with a family member, with a coworker, with, um, with their church. What would you say to someone who was nervous about doing that? I'm nervous about my answer. Uh, <laughs> because my answer, I'm getting ready to disagree with a, a creative genius from Hollywood because I don't think the last episode of Dope Sick is a love letter to MHT. I think the last episode of Dope Sick is a love letter to the value of community and relationship as portrayed in the last scene when Keaton walks into the 12-step group and he sits down there and he talks about shared pain. Medication is a tool that helps us into recovery and it's a wonderful gift and it saves people's lives. Guys, we'll change this whenever we engage in community and relationship. The past panel talked about the importance of support, ongoing support. Ryan talked about it, T talked about it, uh, talked about that going forward. This is about community and relationship and when, when uh, Dr. Phoenix leads forward and he starts talking about the pain and then he said, if we're willing to dig into that pain and we're willing to share that pain, we might find our better selves which I think is one of the greatest things I've ever heard. And I'm so grateful for you two for finishing the, the series that way. So whenever we're willing to become vulnerable, we're willing to share our hurts and our pains and our fears and all the things that go against us in a, on a daily basis with those around us, then I think that this is achievable. And I want to share this real quick. And I'm sorry, Secretary Walsh, and I don't even know if I can text in this place, but, but while you were speaking, I text our entire, our entire company and I said, Secretary of Labor, uh, uh, Marty Walsh is in recovery. And those little heart things that come up on your text, <laughs> I got 41 of them in about 20 <laughs> seconds. So thank you for doing that because it's really important. Um, this has been an amazing moment for me. Thank you all for the work that you do. Um, thank you all for making audience for them. Um, and please give them one more round of applause. Time to announce the next speaker, um, Representative David Trone. Um, as the, uh, we have a tight, oh wow, none of these things are things I'm supposed to be saying. I'm the guy reading the liner notes in the script. Um, uh, our next speaker is a champion of effective substance use disorder policies on Capitol Hill. I am pleased to introduce Congressman David Trone. <laughs> there it is. Wow, that was great. What a great series that was, too. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. And uh, chance to meet the doc. I mean, how cool was that? Very cool. So uh, thanks for having us here today. And uh, it's great to be here with the secretary, uh, Dr. Gupta, Madeline Dean. I see so many uh, faces we know, uh, Harry, throughout the audience here. It's sort of like uh, our team coming together. And I feel like we put together a team uh, in the house and we've worked coherently together, and uh, we are on a mission, and we all share the same mission. And it's nice when we see that vision, and we just keep taking the steps, one at a time, uh, to get there, because we've got to provide the help, we've got to provide the change, and if we don't get it done, you know, collectively as a community, shame on us, because we're better than that. So thank you all here today for all you've done and will do. Uh, in our mission. On my prepared remarks, two years our nation has dealt with an unbelievable crisis, COVID, and we demonstrate our ability to rally together for a common cause. We stepped up to help our neighbors in need. We invested literally trillions of dollars 
in businesses and families in our communities to sustain our economy, produce life-saving therapeutics, vaccines. We came together as Americans. But while we were focused on COVID, another crisis of path and destruction just accelerated. As we know the 20-year history from opioids to heroin, and now it's fentanyl. But in 2021, as mentioned, 108,000 Americans died from an overdose. 80% of those were fentanyl. I lost a nephew to fentanyl. Today, it's estimated this costs our economy at a trillion dollars a year. Think about that. That's a big, big number. Today, to make matters worse, Stanford estimates in the next 10 years, we're going to lose 1.2 more million Americans. This is not stopping from overdoses. So for those that are in the shadows, as Hubert Humphrey talked about, the shadows of life, we can't afford not to take urgent and decisive action. So we're here today to advocate for solutions like medication for opioid use disorder so Americans can find and stay on the road to recovery. We're here today to listen to the voices. And I really need, and we need, and Madeline needs, you know, your input, your ideas. This new book coming out, we'll scour that. But we need ideas so we can turn them into authorizations and then appropriations and help move this cause where it needs to be. So those voices about those impacted by substance use on the first panel, uh, very helpful. They amplify that uh, to our nation's highest office where we are today. So, but we're here today to be in the business of not lip service, but the business of action. Goodness gracious, one minute. In the last few months, the House has passed billions of dollars to fight these crises. The biggest bill is the Restoring Hope and Mental Health Wellbeing Act, passed the House 402 to 20, bipartisan. This package had over 30 bills in it, eight of which I introduced are co-led, and it combats the intertwined addiction to mental health head on. Two of these bills we talked about today, we've got to get all these out after the lame duck session. That's when they have to come out. I met with Schumer actually yesterday morning, and he's on the team, and Burr's on the team, and we can get them out of the help committee. And the Mainstreaming Addiction Act, the MAT Act, Paul Tonko's Act, we're all co-sponsors. Co We've got to get that to eliminate the X waiver. That will help Matt expand. That is crucial. The other bill we helped lead was Lori Trahan's bill from Massachusetts that gets training to our docs to understand addiction and how there's other ways to fight it. So these bills will make it easier to prescribe medication and require physicians to look ahead. But we can't stop there. We have the Bipartisan Mental Health and Task Force, 140 members strong. We introduced this year 106 bills from all about the epidemic, and seven of those have been signed by the President of the law. 22 have passed the House. So with this many lives online, we have the unwavering support of the President, the unity agenda, job one was addiction, job two was mental health. We have Secretary Gupta leading the way. We have Dr. Delphin Rittman, all your help at HHS, we've been together. Marty Walsh and his whole story and leadership. So we've got to fight and stay on the front line for this. It's time to come together as a nation, this epidemic, and do everything in our power to stop it. Uh, we must fight to save these innocent lives. So now I'd like to introduce my friend, and a champion for those struggling with mental health and addiction, Congresswoman Madeline Dean. What a powerful set of presentations. I feel so lucky to be here today with all of you. I thought I would be able to start without crying, but be that as it may. I'm inspired by all of you. So thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you for the seriousness with which you take your work and the compassion that you bring to it. Thank you to the second gentleman, uh, Doug Emhoff, uh, for his commitment uh, to this issue, to the urgency of this issue, to the humanity of this issue. 
Thank you, Secretary Marty Walsh. What an inspiring set of stories you are. Thank you for what you are doing for our country. I am going to pull this together any second. <laughs> Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, thank you. It's a pleasure to get to know, with, know you and get to work with you. I want to just give a shout out to Jemiah Williams, who is here, my coworker uh, and legislative correspondent. I'm so pleased she's able to be here. Mostly, I'm so proud of this administration. This administration is so committed to tackling the scourge that is opioid overdose addiction death. We have to do so much, so thank God during this National Recovery Month, this unity agenda, a priority of this administration has been lifted up. My name is Madeline Dean. I'm Congresswoman for the 4th Congressional District of Montgomery County. That's Montgomery and Berks Counties. Delighted to serve. I'm in my second term. Delighted to serve alongside David Trone. You can feel and see his passion. But today I stand before you mostly as the mother of a son in recovery. So Harry, you're gonna hate me for doing this, but do you mind just standing with me while I speak? This is my son, Harry Canan. <laughs> it's a mother's job to embarrass, <laughs> and it's your job to be next to me, and that's what's a gift. I think back to when Harry was uh, first starting high school. He bounced into high school. He was enthusiastic about life and everything. But then everything began to change. His friends, his habits, his energy. He was flat and tired all the time. He was sick, sickly, his many gifts ebbing away. Like many parents and families, I was scared. Scared for my little boy, worried he might not make it home, worried he might get hurt, or worse, that he might die. And through my fear, we battled. Boy, did we battle. But we also battled for Harry. And we asked him finally if he was willing to get help, and he said yes. And I stand here proud to say that next month, October 30th, 2022, we will celebrate 10 years of long-term recovery. But mostly, I'm proud to stand here because of what Harry has taught me about recovery. There is hope. He always reminds me, 75% of people will find recovery. It's our job to make that 85%, to make it 95%, and then to make it everyone. We know the urgency. We've talked about it. 108,000 people died last year of overdose. I call that a jetliner a day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 300 souls a day crashing to the earth. That's why I am so proud to work with this administration and have talked directly with the president uh, about these issues. He cares so much about it. We have to ground that jetliner a day and your advocacy, the people who spoke here, uh, dope sick, writer, creator, inspiration. Uh, we are going to turn that corner. We are going to make a difference. Uh, so I'm going to skip because I see my time is running out. I'm going to skip the fact that, please note, that this administration has signed into law resources, really serious resources, whether it was through the Amer American Rescue Plan uh, or Inflation Reduction Act or CARES work with mental health and addiction, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so I guess what I want to do is, is say that David and I, all of government, legislators, are committed to partnering with all of you, your authentic stories, your advocacy, uh, the power of your storytelling and the compassion and mercy that you bring to it. Uh, we're here to say that for any loved one who is suffering with substance use disorder, with addiction, there is hope. My family found hope, and yours can too. It is my honor, Harry and my honor, to fight with you in this moment of extraordinary need, but extraordinary opportunity based on the very people I see in this room. So thank you for including Harry and me today. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, thank you to all of you for today, uh, including today's speakers, as well as everyone who's participated in this summit, including the second gentleman, Secretary Walsh, Assistant Secretary Dolphin Rittman, and Representative Trone and Representative Dean. 
as well as our two outstanding panels. Thank you all so much. Let's have a round of applause for everybody. Now the actions that we've announced today, along with the many actions that we have already taken, this is how we're going to beat the opioid epidemic, opioid overdose epidemic. And folks, as today's speakers demonstrated, there's no silver bullet to ending this epidemic. It takes all of us, all of us, bringing together diverse strengths to the table and working together to make sure that people get the help and the support that they need. So thank you for doing your part. There's no question, absolutely no question at all, that together we're gonna make a real difference for the American people. So thank you very much.